This is Eric once again, and today I'll be discussing the EKG characteristics and diagnosis of myocardial infarction. The specific learning objectives are first, to describe the relationship between ST elevation MIs, or STEMIs, non-ST elevation MIs, or N-STEMIs, Q-wave MIs, and non-Q-wave MIs. Second, to estimate the age of an MI based on EKG characteristics. Next, to localize a STEMI or Q-wave MI to a most likely affected myocardial region and vascular territory. And the last, to list the common conduction system pathologies which can be the consequence of infarction. This is a rather lengthy topic, so instead of a single 30 or 35 minute video, I'm dividing it into two separate videos, the first of which will be a little bit longer and cover more basic material, and the second one, which will be a little bit shorter, will cover a couple of advanced topics. MIs can electrocardiographically be classified in various different ways. They can be classified based on waveform morphology, such as STEMI versus NSTEMI, or Q-wave versus non-Q-wave, or they can be classified based on age, such as acute versus subacute versus quote unquote old. Finally, they can also be classified based upon localization to an affected wall or to a culprit coronary vessel. Clinically, the most important classification to understand is STEMI versus NSTEMI. Acute coronary syndrome is an umbrella term to describe a collection of related pathophysiology characterized by supply demand mismatch of oxygen to myocardial tissue typically from a focal obstruction in a coronary vessel. Acute coronary syndrome is divided into one category for ST elevation MIs and one category for both non-ST elevation MIs and unstable angina. Electrocardiographically, STEMIs demonstrate ST elevations in two or more anatomically contiguous leads and usually, but not always, ST depressions and or T-wave inversions in other leads. N-STEMIs and unstable angina may or may not have ST depressions and or T-wave inversions, but the EKG may also be completely normal. N-STEMIs and unstable angina are differentiated from one another only by elevation of biomarkers in the former, such as troponin. In addition to the distinction between presence or absence of ST elevations, other common EKG findings during or following an MI include pathologic Q-waves, new QRS axis deviation, poor R-wave progression, and various types of new conduction blocks, such as AV block or bundle branch blocks. You may have heard previously of the distinction between Q-wave MIs and non-Q-wave MIs. This terminology is largely obsolete, but previously referred to whether or not an MI resulted in the development of pathologic Q-waves. The terminology has since been replaced by the STEMI versus NSTEMI distinction just reviewed. Now occasionally I've seen a resource or heard someone explain those terms by stating that a STEMI is the new word for a Q-wave MI and an N-STEMI is the new word for a non-Q-wave MI. This is absolutely not true. Both STEMIs and N-STEMIs alike may or may not result in Q-waves. Let's discuss the chronological evolution of EKG findings following an acute MI. I review changes in the QRS complex, ST segments, and T waves during the minutes, hours, days, weeks, and years following an acute occlusion. The very first change that can occur is increased prominence of T waves, which are often referred to as hyperacute T waves. These develop within the first several minutes and do not last very long. They may already be gone before the patient reaches medical attention which contributes to their relatively uncommon observation. At some point, usually a little under an hour, give or take, ST segments will become deviated. These may be ST elevations or ST depressions. While ST elevations typically last a couple of days and potentially even up to a week or so, ST depression can last much longer and occasionally indefinitely. Within the first several hours, T waves will become inverted which also may last indefinitely. The final new change is the development of Q waves, which are typically permanent, but may occasionally spontaneously disappear over weeks or even years. These various changes, when combined with patient symptoms and biomarkers, 
can provide the necessary clues to accurately determine the age of an acute or subacute infarct with a good degree of reliability. However, once an infarct is more than several days old, that is, once ST elevations have resolved and biomarkers have returned to baseline, it is usually impossible to date an infarct from the EKG. In other words, an infarct that is 10 years old may look exactly the same way as on EKG as it did when it was only a week old. Beyond temporal localization, MIs can often also be anatomically localized. Specifically, acute STEMIs can be localized to a specific anatomic region. Subacute or old MIs, which have resulted in pathologic Q waves, can also be localized to an anatomic region, though this is not completely reliable and assumes the cause of the Q wave must be an old infarct, which may or may not be the case. However, acute end STEMIs and old non-Q wave MIs cannot be accurately localized. That's because the location of ST depression and T wave inversions seen in these situations do not correspond to the location of infarcted territory. In order to localize STEMIs and Q wave MIs to a specific region of the heart or to a likely culprit vessel, we'll need to review some cardiac anatomy as well as revisit the early topic of EKG lead groupings. From a clinical perspective, the ventricular myocardium can be subdivided into different regions, often called walls. The subdivisions are not exact and not everyone uses the same list. However, for the specific task of EKG interpretation, I separate the ventricular myocardium into eight regions, which are supplied by one of the three major coronary arteries. In the front of the heart is the left anterior descending artery, or LAD. The LAD supplies the interventricular septum, the anterior wall, and the apex. Wrapping around the lateral aspect of the heart is the circumflex artery, which supplies the lateral wall. Although most non-cardiologists don't refer to this, a superior section of the lateral wall is occasionally called the high lateral wall. This region is important to distinguish because while the remainder of the lateral wall is supplied by the circumflex, the high lateral wall can be supplied by either the circumflex or the LAD or by the combination of the two. On the other side of the heart, the right coronary artery supplies the right ventricle. And the final major vascular territory is that of the posterior descending artery, which supplies the inferior and posterior walls. The major variation in coronary circulation between different patients is what the origin is of that posterior descending artery. In what is known as a right dominant circulation, the PDA and thus the inferior and posterior walls are supplied by the right coronary artery. This occurs in roughly 80% of people, though the estimates reported in different sources vary slightly. In a left dominant circulation, which is seen in approximately 15% of people, the PDA comes off of the circumflex. And in the last 5% of people, they have co-dominant circulation in which the PDA is supplied by both the RCA and the circumflex. As one final, much rarer variant, the LAD wraps around the apex and supplies the PDA in an apical to basal direction, though this is very, very uncommon. To understand how to connect an EKG tracing to anatomic localization, I'll need to also review those lead groupings. As discussed in one of the earliest videos in this course, the 12 EKG leads are frequently placed into groups based on their ability to identify pathology in certain parts of the heart. For example, leads 2, 3, and AVF are the inferior leads, V1 and V2 are the septal leads, V3 and V4 are the anterior leads, and V5, V6, 1, and AVL are the lateral leads. Although this is the common way in which most physicians group EKG leads, it is also unfortunately an oversimplification. First, in reality, there is overlap between the septal and anterior leads and the anterior and lateral leads. For example, a large anterior MI may extend from V2 through V5 or even a larger subset of leads. Next, empiric observation has shown that MIs which impact V1 through V4 although historically referred to as anteroseptal MIs, actually usually involve the left ventricular apex and spare the septum.
As I mentioned a minute ago, the lateral wall can be subdivided into the lateral wall proper and the high lateral wall, and the leads can be further subdivided as well. One in AVL give the best view of that high lateral wall, which can be supplied by either the LAD or the circumflex. V1 and V2, in addition to providing a view of the septum and occasionally the anterior and apical walls, can also provide a view of the posterior wall. However, the morphology of abnormalities in V1 and V2 from a posterior MI are the inverse of what you would typically expect since the posterior wall is situated directly opposite from the direction of these leads. This will be discussed in more detail in part two of this video. And finally, V1 and V2, in addition to everything else, also provide the best view of the 12 conventional EKG leads of the right ventricle. That also will be discussed in more detail later. So there is the more complete and accurate version of the anatomic groupings of EKG leads, which is unfortunately a bit messier than the original version we started off with. An important EKG characteristic of acute MIs that I have not yet discussed yet are something called reciprocal changes. These are those EKG changes that are seen on the side of the heart opposite from the site injury. These are typically in the form of SD depressions. As the heart is an irregularly shaped structure without clear pairing of opposite sides, the location of reciprocal changes may not be intuitive. For example, inferior stemmies can lead to reciprocal changes in the anterior leads, and anterior stemmies can lead to reciprocal changes in the inferior leads. The anterior and inferior walls certainly don't seem like they should be on opposite sides of the heart, but on the EKG, they can act as if they are. So at this point, let's put this together, all of this together, that is, into a four-step process for describing an MI based on a patient's EKG. Step one, identify the region of the heart that is most likely infarcting or has infarcted. Step two, identify the most likely location of the occlusion. Step three, identify how old the infarct is. And the last, summarize the overall impression. Let's look at four quick examples. In the interest of time, I won't be reviewing each using a comprehensive systematic method, but will just focus on the findings of ischemia or infarction. Also, we'll make the assumption that each EKG belongs to a patient whose clinical history and exam is consistent with ischemia and infarction as the etiology of the EKG findings we're looking for. After all, there are many other etiologies of ST deviations and pathologic Q waves. So let's start with this EKG. Jumping right to the punchline, there are ST elevations in leads 2, 3, and AVF, as well as the ST depressions in V2, V3, 1, and AVL, which are likely reciprocal changes. So first, what region of the heart is most likely infarcting? 2, 3, and AVF are the inferior leads, so therefore it's the inferior wall. This is consistent with the prominent reciprocal changes in V2 and V3. The changes in 1 and AVL are not necessarily as classic, but still not uncommon. Next, where is the most likely location of the occlusion? The inferior wall can be supplied by either the RCA or circumflex, and we don't know enough to speculate which in this case. Then how old is the infarct? With prominent ST elevations in those inferior leads, but no T-wave inversions or Q-waves in them, it suggests that the infarct is on the order of minutes to hours old. So to summarize the overall impression, we could say that this patient is experiencing an acute inferior STEMI. Here's another example. Consider pausing the video here to give yourself a moment to look over it on your own. ST elevations are seen in V2 through V5, so the region of the heart that appears to have infarcted is the anterior wall. This is supplied by the LAD, and although many trainees initially assume that ST elevations suggest the MI is very acute, you can see there are also pathologic Q waves here that have developed in V2 and V3. Since Q waves take hours to days to develop, this infarct must be that old and during this window of time, ST elevations and Q waves can coexist. So in summary, this EKG shows a subacute anterior MI.
Here's example three. There are no ST elevations this time, but we do see Q waves in 2, 3, and AVF, suggesting the infarct affected the inferior wall. As mentioned earlier, Q waves don't localize quite as well as ST elevations, so this is just a reasonable hypothesis. And as with example one, we can't say in this case whether the inferior wall is supplied by the RCA or circumflex. As far as timing goes, with Q waves present and no other ischemic changes, the infarct must be old, in which old is defined as anything from weeks to years. So in summary, a probable old inferior infarct. For anyone wondering about the ST depressions and T wave inversions in 1 and AVL, these are not reciprocal changes. Reciprocal changes are typically only present in the acute and subacute phases. In this case, those findings are probably a secondary repolarization abnormality due to left ventricular hypertrophy and has absolutely nothing to do with the prior MI. Here's the last example. If we inspect every lead, we see ST elevations in 2, 3, and AVF, as well as in V5 and V6. So therefore, both the inferior and the lateral walls are involved. Unlike in prior examples in which the inferior wall was affected and we are unable to localize the occlusion to a single vascular territory, the combination of inferior with lateral involvement makes it highly probable that this patient has a circumflex occlusion occurring in a left dominant circulation, since neither a right dominant circulation nor an RCA obstruction would be expected to cause this particular pattern. As with example 2, we see both Q waves and ST elevations in the inferior leads, meaning the infarct is hours to days old. So in summary, this is a subacute inferior lateral STEMI. I'll end part 1 of this two-part video on myocardial infarction by putting all of this information about the anatomic localization of MIs together into one chart. This is a summary of common injury patterns and likely culprit vessel. When the septum alone is involved in an MI, the primary ischemic changes are seen in V1 and V2. There are typically no reciprocal changes seen in an isolated septal MI. The most likely culprit vessel is the LAD. Anterior MIs typically involve leads V3 through V4, plus or minus V2 and or V5. Reciprocal changes are seen in 2, 3, and AVF, and the culprit vessel is the LAD. Lateral MIs typically involve V5, V6, plus minus 1, and or AVL. Reciprocal changes are again in the inferior leads. The most likely culprit vessel is the circumflex. An isolated MI of just the high lateral wall impacts one AVL only. Inferior reciprocal changes again. And although both the circumflex and LAD can supply this region of the heart, when only one in AVL are affected, the culprit vessel is usually the LAD. Inferior MIs involve 2, 3, and AVF, with reciprocal changes in either V2 and V3, and as we saw, occasionally in 1 and AVL. As mentioned multiple times, inferior MIs can be the consequence of occlusion in either the RCA or CERC. So-called anteroseptal MIs, which as mentioned are actually usually apical anterior MIs, have changes in V1 through V4 with inferior reciprocal changes and are due to LAD occlusion. Anterior lateral MIs are a combination of findings of an anterior MI and a lateral MI and are always due to LAD occlusion. Finally, inferior lateral MIs are a combination of findings of an inferior MI and a lateral MI. They are due to circumflex occlusion in a patient with left dominant circulation. That's the end of part one of this two-part video on myocardial infarction. The next part will discuss special situations such as posterior and right ventricular infarcts, how to diagnose a STEMI in the setting of a left bundle branch block, and conduction system disease complicating acute MIs.